Today we're going to be discussing the secret fears of codependence. So if you're somebody who is figuring out that you struggle with codependency, you might be a little confused. I know I was. And because so often codependents present themselves to the world as if they have no needs, you kind of box yourself into a corner, dear one. At least I know what, that's what I did. I didn't tell people what I was really doing. I was afraid to disappoint my mother. I felt like she was very happy that I married my husband. I felt like my parents were ecstatic that I married this man. And they were, they loved him. And so me telling them the truth, I risked their love all over again. Because I knew, I knew once I told my parents I'm done, I'm a codependent, I'm wrong. I didn't know I was codependent. I didn't know I was the grandchild of alcoholics on both sides. I didn't know that I had all of these issues. I didn't know that I didn't feel good enough. I didn't know that I thought that I had to prove myself to people. And that's why I married someone who is very happy moving the goalpost, very happy making me feel like I'm not good enough. I didn't know I was re repeating this pattern, but you know what? I'm in therapy. I'm checking myself. I'm holding myself accountable. I'm making amends. I am so sorry. I have done what I have done to my children. I'm so sorry that I've been controlling. I'm so sorry. I didn't see it. I'm so sorry, but I need to change. But unfortunately my ex-husband said, I'm not changing. That's what he said. I'm not changing just because you want to change. Doesn't mean that I have to change. And it was one of the scariest moments of, of my life because that meant in that moment, every single one of my little girl's fears, every fear of my inner child came to the surface. Here it was. I'm going to tell them my truth and they're going to abandon me. And you know what happened? They did. They were very unhappy when I said, I'm getting a divorce. So all of my fears came to the surface and it was hell. It was hell. I don't know how else to explain it. I just said to my husband, Anthony yesterday, I don't know how I got through those early days. I don't know how I got through those early days. It was just pure will to survive and pure desire for something else. So codependence, when we're talking about the secret fears that codependents have, the secret fears are we're not good enough. The secret fear is if I dare to tell my truth and live for myself, the people that I love or the people that I think love me are going to walk away, right? So the secret fear is if I do tell my truth, then you're going to walk away. If I do tell you how I really feel, you're going to walk away. If I dare to look within, I'm going to see all the shame that has been induced over my lifetime as a child, not ever being able to gain the validation of my parents. You, so when you stop, when you get off the hamster's wheel, right? It's in that moment, all of your fears come to the surface in codependency manifesto. It's the book over my shoulder. I talk about facing your dragon. Like everybody has a dragon on the inside. And when you're struggling with codependency, you're living below the veil of consciousness, but you don't know it. You have all of these fears that are really operating your behaviors, but you don't know it. You have all of these emotions that are tied to these faulty beliefs that are the cause of your behaviors that are the cause of your relationship dynamics, but you don't know it. So you're literally living below the veil of consciousness. And you are attracting people who are just as below the veil of consciousness. And that's why if you get angry when you are codependent and you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, look me up because I have figured out how to get out, but it's not easy. It's not easy. And anybody that suggests that healing from codependency is easy is just simply wrong because you have to turn over every stone in your mind. You have to learn how to think in an entirely new way. You have to learn to believe things that you never believed before. And you have to face all of this abandonment stuff. You have to face the inner child that has all these fears that you are not good enough. And the brain is designed to not do that. The brain doesn't want to look at the fears. The brain doesn't want to look at, I don't feel good enough. 
That's why we have all these like neurotic behaviors around caretaking, around anticipating the needs of others, about, you know, around being the first person to volunteer to take the kids soccer team to Canada, right? Why we bake a hundred cookies instead of 30 for the kindergarten class. Why we're always trying to jump in and be more and to rescue and to fix, right? Because we've been taught to perform for love. And this is very dangerous because people who are taught to perform for love, you're going to attract people that make you feel less than. You're going to repeat the dynamic. You're going to attract people like narcissists who feel entitled to exploit you. And unfortunately, when it comes to narcissism, a narcissist sees your vulnerability as a weakness. They feel like they are entitled to put you down and to exploit you. You deserve to be exploited because you're so weak. This is a terrible way to live your life inside a codependent narcissistic dynamic. And if you're in one, I know I was in one. I didn't know I was in one. It is when you get yourself out of it and you look back and you think about the sense of entitlement that a narcissist has to keep you trapped. The sense of entitlement the narcissist has to keep you codependent, to keep you fawning, to keep you people pleasing, to keep you walking on eggshells, to keep you confused, to keep you guilt ridden, to keep you full of shame. It is like they are expunging your right to breathe and to live your own life. That is how serious it is to heal from codependency. Now on the narcissistic side, what ends up happening as, as a codependent is you manifest people who mirror this pattern. And so whatever paradigm that you were born into as a child becomes your internal paradigm, right? And what ends up happening is this is the way you view the world. And we all believe what we experience as children, right? And now what ends up happening is we see what we believe. So if I see internally that love is conditional, I am not good enough. I need to beg for approval. I need validation. I need someone outside of me to declare that I, Lisa, am enough. By the way, no, you don't. You were born enough. That's right. You're divine. At your core, you are born enough. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody, but if you're codependent paradigm says otherwise. Unfortunately, dear one, what ends up happening is through the magic of the matrix. This is the paradigm that gets created. If you look at your work situations, ask yourself, is there any codependent narcissism going on here? Do I acquiesce? Do I brown nose? Right? Am I a super achiever? Am I perfectionistic? Is my value dependent upon what other people think because IE that is you seeking conditional love because your subconscious mind has programmed you to believe that you as yourself are not good enough. It's not okay for you to make a mistake. It's not okay for you to talk about your feelings. It's not okay for you to have a need. It's not okay for you to cry. It's not okay for you to just be, I love Shakespeare's soliloquy in Hamlet to be or not to be. That is the question. That is the question every codependent person is going to need to face. And quite frankly, every narcissist's question too. The difference between a codependent and a narcissist is self-awareness. A narcissist has zero self-awareness or very self. They're aware of the self, but I'm talking about the ability to self-analyze. I'm talking about the ability to look within and see the space that carries our wounds and to be humble and to self uh, regulate and to be self accountable. Like, wow, I did that. I really hurt someone. But in order to do that, you have to be somewhat of a healthy person, which means that you're going to have to have empathy for other people, which means you're going to have to experience emotions. You're going to have to have this internal experience of emotions when it comes to other people, which narcissist studies are proving that they don't have. They don't have the same emotional response you or I would have to someone else in pain. They don't have the Jiminy Cricket moment where, oh, I shouldn't have said that, or, oh, I lied, or, ooh, that was um, arrogant of me, or, ooh, 
that was a little mean or, ooh, that was a little self-righteous of me. Like, ooh, that was very critical. They don't have the Jiminy Cricket. You know, they've squashed Jiminy Cricket a long time ago, you know? So that's a big difference between somebody who, I think it's a generalization, but the kind of people that I attract into my community and the people who take my programs and purchase my, my products are people that want that Jiminy Cricket moment, but they don't only want the Jiminy Cricket, cricket aha, this is what I'm doing wrong moment. They want tools, right? So they want the gladiator moment. They want the warrior moment. They want to know what can I do now? And that's where all of my books come in and all of my programs come in and what this YouTube channel is all about. Today we're going to be discussing narcissists and therapy. So let's start off by explaining always that narcissism is a personality trait. It is something that slides up and down a spectrum. So you can have a narcissistic trait you can have narcissism, you can be more narcissistic one day, less narcissistic another day. You can have a bout of entitlement and resolve it very quickly. You and I, I include myself when I say you, you and I can have a period where we blame someone else for why we feel the way we feel, but hopefully we rebound and we recognize that that's not healthy. We recognize that it's up to us to take care of ourselves. We recognize that blaming other people for our failures is unfair and it's not healthy and we're not teaching our children anything about self-accountability and self-reliance and self-respect. When we're talking about narcissists in therapy, we're talking about, at least in this session, what I wanted to talk about is what does the science say about how narcissists behave in therapy and why are they so difficult to treat? Why are they so difficult to diagnose and, and why is it so hard to get to the root core of someone's narcissism? Now there are some people, and if you haven't read The Narcissism Epidemic by um, Jean Twenge and Keith Campbell, I highly recommend it. It's quite a read. And one of the things that he talks about and she talks about is this idea that there's a myth when it comes to narcissism that they're exploring. And the myth is that all narcissists are wounded at their core. There are these wounded ducks and they have this false image that, that they are presenting to the world because they're really insecure. Dr. Campbell and Dr. Twenge are suggesting that there are narcissists that actually score pretty high on the self self-esteem tests, which implies that not all narcissists are struggling with um, a dark soul and tremendous abandonment. There are narcissists that like themselves and really do believe that you're less than. Now, when we're talking about narcissists in therapy, why would a narcissist in Silicon Valley who is, is running an amazing company that, you know, their, their stock is going through the roof. Everybody wants to rub elbows with them. Everybody wants to drop their name. Everybody wants to be in the it group. Why would that person go into therapy? Even though the employees may see narcissism in them and lose respect for him or her over time, why would that narcissist go into therapy? There's no reason to really. It stands to reason that if you're a Silicon Valley CEO and you're a narcissist, that you're probably not gonna go into therapy because your life looks pretty good from the outside. It might even feel good on the inside. That narcissist might be highly destructive, might be highly immoral, perhaps, not saying that everybody who runs a um, who is a, C, a CFO or a CEO is, is immoral. I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about the narcissistic head of a company. Are they going to go into therapy if they're driving around in the Maserati and they have a couple of penthouses all throughout the States and may, maybe even throughout the world and people are throwing themselves at them? Their life feels pretty good, looks pretty good. So they're not going to go into therapy. 
The people who date them will go into therapy. The people who love them, people who work with narcissists, who suffer, suffer from PTSD as a result of working with people who are highly narcissistic or anxiety or, or depression, they will go into therapy, but not the narcissist. Now, when we're talking about what happens probably more likely on the daily is that partners of narcissists drag them into therapy. And according to Psychiatric Times, uh, I will post the link in the description box, there's some pretty incredible insights that I wanted to share with you. And what they discuss, the three reasons that they outline pretty clearly as to why narcissists do poorly in therapy is because there's a reluctance to therapy. There is a negative therapeutic reaction. So they're really not interested in being there and they react poorly to the actual therapy and early dropout rate. So if a narcissist does end up in therapy, then they're going to be reluctant to work with the therapist to open up and they're going to have a negative reaction to being prodded. They're going to have a negative reaction to a therapist wanting to dig deep or maybe even asking them to be a little bit more self-reflective, which is accountability. And they tend not to stay in therapy. Another thing that the article suggests is that narcissism also comes along with other disorders. It comes along with MDD or major depressive disorder. It comes along with bipolar disorder. It can be seen with addiction, alcoholism. There tends to be a preoccupation with criticism of other people and also a preoccupation with blaming other people. Now, if you've been to therapy, the whole point of therapy is to be introspective. It's to learn about what I can do to fix myself. What can I do to stop blaming other people? How can I identify areas in my life that I continue to screw up in so that I can change? Because ultimately, the only person that can change in your life that you have control over is you. We get stuck when we're in narcissistic relationships because we're looking at this poor behavior and in our head, we think if, they, if the narcissist would just stop doing that, then we'd be better. And we're doing what a narcissist does. We're blaming a narcissist and we're giving our power over to a narcissist when instead we should be asking ourselves, how do I feel about this work environment? How do I feel about this friendship with this narcissistic friend that I have who is dismissive, who is argumentative, who expects me to just drop everything to be there for them all the time, even though they have a severe lack of empathy for the fact that my mother just died, right? It's not about ever about me. It's, wow, your mother died and now you can't be there for me. Like what's up with that? You know, it's, it's that bad when you're dealing with a narcissistic friend. And so what we have to do, if you're someone who is in love with a narcissist or has a narcissistic friend or whose parent is a narcissist, one of the things that we're trying to learn how to do is to detach and to, to sit in the space of, well, how does this narcissistic behavior affect me? So we want to cut these cords to narcissistic personalities and learn to stay in our body while we figure out, like, how does this make me feel? What am I in control over? What am I not in control over? And another thing to keep in mind is that the past will will is a pretty good judge for your future. And so if you've had this terrible experience with someone with narcissism, you can you have to accept that that is the the biggest indicator that your future is going to look similar to that. And so the only person that you can really change is you. And so when we're talking about a narcissist in therapy, there's a resistance to change. There's a reluctance that therapists and psychiatrists note in patients who have narcissism or who are struggling with NPD. There is this aversion to the whole therapeutic situation. There is this blaming thing going on. Lots of times, narcissists will end up in therapy because a spouse has brought them there or they've gotten a bunch of DUIs. 
or they're looking to um, screw around and take advantage of disability insurance. Sometimes they've gotten into a bunch of fights and now they have to go in for anger management and part of what they need to do to keep their job is to go into therapy. Another issue that narcissists will have and make them resistant to therapeutic techniques is that they don't believe that a therapist is intelligent enough to actually help them. They believe that they are more intelligent than the therapist. So it's sort of like a joke. What are you, what are you going to teach me? Like you really think that you know me better than I know me. You really think that you're going to be able to help me. And so it's not a therapeutic setting. In order for someone to be helped by a therapist, there has to be some trust that the person that you're speaking to is ac actually has some level of competence that is going to be favorable to you to help you bring about change in your life. So it's almost like a competition between a, the narcissist and the therapist. So when a narcissist ends up in therapy, it's a joke. In most cases, they don't really want to be there. They, they feel like they have to be there. The court says that they have to be there. The um, attorney in the divorce case has suggested that the people that, that are in the custody suit be evaluated. They have to be evaluated. So it's not like a narcissist, a narcissist is actually walking into therapy. In lots of cases, they've been dragged or they feel forced into a therapeutic situation. Narcissists tend to be defensive. And so even in a, any conversation, whether it's with a therapist or with a colleague or, or with a friend, narcissists tend to be really irritable that you're suggesting that they need to listen, that they need to learn something. So it's because in their head, they have this grandiose version of themselves, this, self, self, this sense of importance. And to them, you're a jokester. You have no value. Like, why are you asking me these questions? Like, how dare you even suggest that I should be answering your questions? So they tend to be very defensive. One of their goals in therapy is to manipulate the therapist. So they're even trying to strategize and figure out a way where they can manipulate the clinician, figure out a way to get the clinician to do what they want them to do. So if this narcissist needs to be cleared because of anger management, then they want the clinician to write them off, tell, tell the court that I showed up for X amount of sessions. Another thing that will happen in therapy with a narcissist is that they want to feel special. And so they will push therapists' boundaries. They want extra time. They want you to treat them more uniquely. They might want an, a, a, a personal parking space. This makes it difficult to treat them because their sense of entitlement shows up in therapy. And so when you're trying to help someone who is a narcissist, dealing with their entitlement gets in the way because they really do think that they're special and they want the clinician or the therapist or the doctor to view them that way. This gives them a strategic edge over other people and even over the clinician, so they think. In order for therapy to work, you have to have trust and a willingness to look within. You have to trust the person that you're working with. In order to be in a healthy relationship, you have to trust the person that you're in a relationship with. In order for therapy to work, you have to be willing to share your vulnerabilities. And narcissists tend not to have the patience. Narcissists don't have the willingness to go within to be introspective. They don't have the willingness to change their mindset. They're very dismissive. And they have not a whole lot of patience for other people who they think they should think well of. So if you're thinking about a therapeutic situation, it's presumed, presumed that the therapist should be able to help the narcissist. And what happens is because this distrust of the therapist, they get their, there becomes this competition between the narcissist and the therapist. And sometimes the competition is for the therapist's favor. So if you have a narcissist as a spouse or a coworker or a friend and you're in therapy, then we have triangulation going on. The narcissist might even want to have sessions with you alone, separate from your spouse, just so they can start the smear campaign, the triangulation, 
just so they can start to explain how special and unique the situation is with their partner and how they must understand what's really going on. So they're trying to hijack the sessions when they're in therapy, which is one way to make sure that therapy is not going to work when you're in therapy with your partner. So this idea of playing on a team, narcissists are not very good at team sports. They need to be seen as leaders. They need to be seen as superior. And so in a therapy, so imagine you're bringing your spouse or your coworker or a friend, a family, a family member into therapy, and you believe that this person has high narcissistic traits. This narcissist is going to be dismissive and may even want to manipulate the therapist to their advantage so that they can try so he or she could triangulate the therapist against you. So they're not very patient. They're not there to be introspective. The idea that they have to be in therapy annoys them, right? You've dragged them into therapy. There's nothing wrong with them. You just don't understand them. If you just listen to everything that they told you to do, you'd get along. If you just listen to me, Lisa, if you did everything I told you to do, if you admitted to me that you were ridiculous, that, that your suggestion that we should be able to have an equal conversation is ridiculous. Look how you live. You're just too much. You just want too much. You're never happy. You're just so sensitive. What's the big deal if we don't talk? What's the big deal if I don't care about your feelings? Why do we have to talk about your feelings? Right? So they're very dismissive. So now you're in a therapeutic situation. That person is not going to hear what the therapist has to say. In two different situations with my ex-husband, he quit therapy. In the situation where I found my own personal psychotherapist and my therapist suggested that we bring my ex-husband in, he absolutely refused. And when I wanted my children to go into therapy, which the psychotherapist suggested, my ex-husband was not happy about it. He made a big stink. He didn't want the kids to go into therapy. So there was this big resistance to going into therapy, which is basically, basically what you're saying is I'm in resistance to looking within. I'm in resistance to change. I'm not going to change, right? This is who I am. What I noticed in my own life with my parents growing up was that my parents, especially, especially my dad would discredit therapists. If my father ever heard you discussing therapy, he would put the therapist down. He would say things like, oh, it's a bunch of psycho mumbo jumbo. Those people don't know what they're talking about. They're therapists because they all have problems. So as a child to this man, you feel like, well, am I really going to go into therapy now? This is what my father thinks of therapists. So his distrust of therapist then becomes your, a child's distrust of therapists or my distrust of therapists. In my case, I always felt that I was selfish if I went into therapy because that was also part of my parents' programming that how dare you pay out of pocket or pay anyone to just sit and listen to you. How narcissistic is that is, was their attitude. So me thinking I needed therapy, although I always believe that I need therapy. I knew I was in trouble, but I live with a man who insinuated that if I went to therapy, that meant I was crazy, which is kind of scary. Like, do you really want your spouse to think you're crazy? Do you want everyone in your family to think you're selfish? And maybe it does mean you're selfish. If you're going into therapy, you are spending money to try to get better. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, this dysfunctional family nonsense. In a healthy family, family members want you to do everything you possibly can to understand yourself so you can fix yourself, so you can focus on what you need to change, modify your behavior that's getting you into trouble, get into less trouble in relationships, manifest healthier relationships, get into less trouble at work, and actually develop compassion for yourself and other people and get along better with other people. That's the whole goal. When you come from a narcissistic family, you have all of these mixed messages and all of these negative messages about taking care of yourself. When I finally went into therapy and my, it was only after my ex-husband and I separated that he, he agreed to go into marital therapy and to stay there, but he quit. And 
the therapist was very honest with me. She said, you have to keep growing. Like you can't stop because he's frustrated because we're asking him to be introspective and to take accountability for his part in this relationship. Look, if you're in a codependent narcissistic relationship and you're going to stay, the only way to fix it is if both people come together and agree to fix it. A narcissist that agrees to go into therapy, it's going to be a frustrating process because narcissists are resistant, right? They are generally argumentative. They see the therapist as a threat. They see the therapist as a joke. They see the therapist as competition, right? They don't really want to change. So it's going to be a tough haul. So if you're deciding to stay in a relationship with a narcissist and therapy is part of your plan, just know you're going to be there for quite a while. It's going to take a long time and you're going to need to find the right therapist who isn't going to challenge the narcissist and go head to head with the narcissist. That's not what therapy with the narcissist is all about. You know, if you're going to find a therapist who's going to get triggered by this narcissism, it's the wrong therapist. So you want to make sure that you're dealing with somebody who is highly mature and whose ego isn't invested in the outcome, right? So if you're dealing with someone who's like, I'm going to break this narcissist, that's narcissistic and that's making it about the therapist. And that's not what a true therapist's job is. A true therapist is there to help and support the two of you grow and move beyond these challenges so that you can move into a healthier space. In the codependent narcissistic dynamic, the codependent is the one, in my opinion, that is more able to change. And I can tell you, I've worked with thousands of codependents. I'm a self-proclaimed codependent myself. I was excited when I went into therapy and I finally figured out what was wrong. It was exciting to know there was a name for what I had. It made me excited because like, okay, then I can fix it. If it has a name, then I can fix it. I'm not crazy. My experience with working with so many codependents is that they are relieved when they recognize that they're do that they are doing something wrong because it's, it's so refreshing to realize that you're not crazy, that because there is this name to the thing that you're doing, then you can fix it. And in the case of a narcissist, remember narcissists are not very good at being introspective. And what makes them very, very challenging to live with, to love, to work with, and to you know work with in a therapeutic setting is that although they can identify the feelings of other people, they aren't very good at having the ability to care about how the other person fear, feels. So yeah, I, can, I know that my best friend's mom passed away and I know that she's really needy right now, but I really, you know, when is she going to get over it? You know, so yeah, they were never really close and she, you know, missed the opportunity to have a true mother and daughter experience, but everyone dies. Like, why doesn't she just get over it? And so that makes it really, really difficult to have a healthy relationship with anyone. If, if you cannot have empathy and experience and imagine what other people are going through, there is no relating. There's no relating. You're having a conversation, right? But you're not relating. Relating means that I see you and you see me. And wow, we can, we can imagine what it feels like to walk in one another's shoes. Then I feel seen. Then I can be vulnerable with you because when I share my vulnerability with you, because you know what it feels like to be vulnerable, I know you're not going to exploit it, right? When you're dealing with a narcissist who has the inability or is impaired, cannot do that, doesn't have the same emotional reaction to other people's experiences, then that's really scary because that person doesn't know what it feels like to be you in when you are the most vulnerable, which means that the likelihood that they will exploit you when you're vulnerable is very likely, which is really, if anything made me realize it was time to end my marriage, it was that. It was recognizing that when I was vulnerable, it didn't matter. And when I was vulnerable, when I was most vulnerable, that's when I was hurt the worst. That's when I, I was kicked when I was down. 
I was humiliated more when I was vulnerable. And it was really mind boggling because in my mind, there were just lines I was not going to cross. There were secrets that I was not going to share with anyone. There were things that I was not going to say. But in my relationship with my ex-husband, when I realized that he crosses that line often, and it became as the as and as my children got older, he crossed that line more often with the children. And that is why today they have no contact with him whatsoever. It's a consequence of this lack of empathy thing and thinking that you can say whatever you want to someone and then the next day act like you didn't say it or you act like, oh, I was, it was just a joke or you turn around and you say, well, that's you're so sensitive. That's the reason. And my argument to that eventually was, well, if you weren't so insensitive, then maybe the kids were, wouldn't be so sensitive. There are lines that you just don't cross in relationships. So when it comes to narcissists, they cross those lines. There is this lack of morality. There's this lack of civility that it, that is just part of a narcissist's agenda. Someone with high narcissistic traits will idealize their target. They will love bomb them. Even in friendships, you'll find someone who you first meet who might have high narcissistic traits, who's very complimentary. So they're love bombing you. They're pulling you in. They're not authentic. They really don't see innate value in you. You are their shiny little pet for the moment and it makes them feel good to see you as amazing and to idealize you and to put all of their beliefs in this idea that they're so smart for having you in their life. So when you're dealing with someone with high narcissistic traits, it's important to recognize that they live in a false reality. So they think they're far more intelligent than they actually are. They think that they're far more beautiful than they actually are. And in lots of cases, they actually think they're a lot more spiritual and empathetic than they actually are. You'll see this mask slip the minute you disappoint them, the minute they feel slighted by you. And in their head, they're just waiting for you to disappoint them so they can justify raging at you. And what this does is this, this allows them to feel um, vindicated. This allows them to feel justified in their persecution of you and in their hierarchy where they're supposed to be on the pedestal and you're supposed to be beneath them, acquiescing, praising them, admiring them, telling them how wonderful they are, how beautiful they are, how smart they are, and how uh, less than everyone is than them. That's your job in, in the life of a narcissist. When it comes to why a narcissist has to turn other people against you, it's important to recognize that this, this is a fantasy that in most of the cases, although studies are proving that narcissists are, can be created through overpraising a child, it could, children can develop narcissism early in childhood and actually become narcissistic later on as adults when their parents infuse them with this idea that they are actually entitled when their parents are entitled, when their parents infuse the child with this idea that they're better than other people, or you know they're just so incredible and they deserve preferential treatment. I actually know someone who, someone in my family whose dad is very much like this, who was praised by the mom. The mom was a narcissist and she overpraised the son and really inflated his ego, told him he was a great football player. He was not. And in the process of, you know, creating this very, um, almost incestuous, emotionally incestuous relationship with her son, she was ignoring her husband and really attaching to her son in an unhealthy way. The son and the mother ended up enmeshing and it became very difficult for people outside the family who could see what was going on to actually get through to this man and help him understand like, this is no bueno, this is very, very unhealthy. 
And he ended up having many troubled relationships with women because these women would not validate him as much as his narcissistic mother. So the narcissistic mother's payoff was the son who she, she praised, put on a pedestal and told him, no other woman is going to love you like I do. And anyone who doesn't praise you like I do isn't worth anything to you. And this became a problem in relationships with women because women wanted to come into the relationship equal and expected him to be an equal in the relationship. And he was like, no, his programming was, no, you're beneath me. Even mommy says so. And so he ended up having a number of divorces and had very difficult relationships with his children. But when, we, when it comes to loving someone like this and being in a relationship with someone like this, we have to understand that it can come from, they can be created through a sense of entitlement and overpraise that's unjustified. You can also become narcissistic because you've been so severely abandoned in childhood and you've, ex you've suffered extreme abuse as a child and you've just decided that the world is an unsafe place and to protect yourself, you develop this, these high levels of narcissism. And so you're not able to really integrate the wounds of the past. You have this shell and you live through this veneer and it protects, it protects your very fragile ego. And daring to get close to these wounds is not something that you're willing to do when you're a narcissist. You're not aware of them. You don't want to touch them. And what you do is you live, live behind this false mask. You live within this false reality and you end up really hurting the people that are in your life. And, you know, sometimes you know what you're doing and sometimes you don't. And most of the times you really end up not really caring. Even if you know, wow, I hurt someone, you end up feeling more sorry for yourself than you do with other people. So you're never really able to make any headway and really apologize. Really what happens with people with high narcissism or high narcissistic traits is they're emotionally abusive and they tell their victims, you should apologize to me, right? And, you know, depending how wounded you are as the target, and how afraid you are of the consequences of upsetting someone like this, you might actually end up apologizing. And so we have people who are very wounded, people who are uh, very below the veil of consciousness. And, you know, we don't always recognize that when we're in relationships with these people, where this narcissism is coming from. I've had, I've coached people who have said that they have very high empathy and they end up feeling sorry for someone because they understand the backstory. So they know why they're narcissistic and they end up being in abusive relationships much, much longer than they should. When it comes to understanding why this type of a personality would need to turn people against you, it's important to recognize that when it comes to things like triangulation, what's in actually happening is you are being pulled into this triangle situation and you don't even know it in most most of the cases. So when someone brings another person into this relationship, what they're trying to do is exercise dominance and control over the relationship. They want to hedge their bets. They want to set the stage in case you go and you start complaining about them. They've already poisoned the, the lake, right? So if, if my best friend's a narcissist, I'm hanging out with her and we meet another friend and she's really an art and, and my best friend's a narcissist. Let's say the narcissist will go behind my back and start saying negative things about me to remain in control over the relationship, because we have to recognize that narcissists need to feel in control. They need to control what you think. They need to control what other people think. They need to control what you think about them. And they also need to control about control what other people think about you with them. So it's all about staying ahead of the game and trying to figure out how can I stay in, in dominance and control over this relationship in the event that things don't work out. So they are putting themselves out there long before the relationship even ends. Now, when a narcissist, you have to also understand that a narcissist will generally see themselves as a victim, which is really mind bending when you're dealing with someone with narcissistic rage, who is obviously vindictive, who obviously cannot see people as good and bad 
and is angry because they've idealized you and you happen to be human and they're angry at you and they take all of their all of their anger out on you so you become their the mother that abused them you become the father that abandoned them you become the person that wounded them most but because they haven't been able to integrate really fully integrate the wounds of the past and the shame that comes along with so many of the emotional wounds in the past you deal with narcissistic projection, you deal with anger, you deal with rage, right? They're taking everything that they feel that they haven't been able to integrate and you become their target. And they're convinced because they live below the veil of consciousness that they're justified in what they're saying about you. And you could stand there as the target and be completely confused by the whole situation. And the narcissist that you're dealing with is 100% convinced that you are the reason that they are so angry and you are the reason you did this to them and they will not be able to see that this anger is within them it's sort of like you have someone who has a broken toe and you bump into their toe and they want to push you down maybe even shove you off a cliff right and they're so angry in the moment because their pain the pain in their foot is so intense and you just happen to be standing there and you just bumped into them. So you become the target of the pain and the rage. And they're unable in that reactive moment to recognize, wait a minute, the pain is within me, right? The pain is within me. I have this pain already. This person may have triggered me or reminded me but of the pain, but the pain is within me. And that's why healing is so important. And that's why Unfortunately, studies prove that most narcissists don't do very well in therapy because they think they know better than the therapist, they think they're smarter than the therapist, and they think that they're right. And so they posture themselves as victims. And so when we're talking about why a narcissist has to turn people against you is we have to keep in mind that that's the way they need to see themselves. So if they are the victim, then when they verbally abuse you, when they triangulate you, when they smear your name, when they turn people against you, it's justified because they're a victim. It's important that when you're trying to understand this idea that you understand that the narcissist is going to weave into their story as often as they can this idea that they're a victim. They're a victim of something. They're a victim of their mother. They're a victim of their father. They're a victim of a court system. They're a, vic they're a victim of, you know, someone at work. They're, they're a victim of whatever, right? Whatever's going on in their life, it's not their fault. It's not their fault that they can't hold down a job. It's not their fault that they can't find a job. It's not their fault that they can't get along with people. It's not their fault, whatever, whatever's going on. It's not their fault. And so, when, like I said, they're trying to get out ahead, they're trying to hedge their bets. So if they want to keep this, I'm the victim mentality intact or this victim facade intact, then behind your back, they have to pull in a third party and set the stage for them so that they can continue to be the victim. And so in preparation for you, uh, you possibly going to complain about them, they've already set the stage that they're the victim of you. So what are the kinds of things that they'll say? They'll start to say things like, you know, she's really struggling with her family history and I'm really doing my best to support her. But every once in a while, I really see the effects of her childhood. Well, what do you mean, says the third party? Well, you know, she cries a lot or, you know, she threatens to hurt herself once in a while. And, you know, I do my best to support her, right? So the narcissist is setting the stage that they're a victim of you. This could all be made up, by the way. I personally had someone in my life call my mom and tell her that I was, I was going to threaten, I threatened to hurt myself. And that was an absolute lie. But you see, in that moment, he was posturing himself as a victim. I wasn't telling my family what was going on. I wasn't posturing myself as a victim. If anything, I hurt myself even more by not telling them what was going on in my life. I was trying to act like everything was okay 
when it wasn't okay. I was raised to think that my needs were not important. I was raised to think I had no right to complain. I was raised to think that I was being a drama queen if I dared talk talked about the emotional pain I was in. So I just stuffed it, stuffed it, stuffed it, stuffed it, ended up with asthma and migraine headaches, stomach issues, you name it. And it was a very bad situation because my body just could not hold this pain anymore. I just energetically, physically, mentally, and emotionally There was just a tipping point where I just couldn't take it anymore. And that's when I finally said, we need to do something. We need to go into therapy or we need to end this marriage because I can't live like we have cancer and you're ignoring it. I have to do something, you know. Um, And like cancer, sometimes you have to take drastic measures and you have to cut it out. You have to cut the malignancy out. And in my situation, that's the way I saw my first marriage because he was not willing to work with me and all he wanted to do was to pretend that nothing was wrong and whatever was wrong was me. So I had to change and I just could not change anymore. I just couldn't and I knew it and so something had to get done. And it took me a really long time to put the pieces of the puzzle together because since I was a little, little girl, I was told that I was crazy, that I didn't have a right to feel what I felt. And so, yes, as I opened my mouth during my marriage and I said, I think we need to fix this. And the response was, well, you're crazy. There's something wrong with you. No one thinks like you. You're the only person that thinks like you. Why aren't you happy? Who do you think you are not to be happy? There's nothing wrong with me. I I am happy. If you're unhappy, it has to be you. And I would look and I would think, well, everyone loves him. He's so charismatic with the neighbors and the strangers and, and, you know, the kids on the block love him and my family loves him. It must be me. I didn't understand I was being gaslit to question my own reality, to question my own thought process. It was so sad when I think back and I think about the young mom I was, you know, so confused, so, so, so terribly confused so depressed, more and more anxiety was building up in my body. And I just felt so lost. And I didn't understand that behind my back, there was this triangulation going on where I was being, was being spoken about in a way that I was defective. And he was posturing himself as a hero and was trying to get my family against trying to turn my family against me. And he did, he did. He was able to turn my family against me. And so when I finally started to really peel back and understand what was going on, I understood that there was, this was coming from a place of needing to see himself as a victim. And when you posture yourself as a victim, then you're able to justify your actions. So when you're dealing with a narcissist who is turning people against you, in my opinion, oftentimes it's rooted in, well, I'm the victim here, right? And if I'm the victim, then my actions are justified. I can say and do whatever I want to do if I'm the victim. And if I'm the victim, then I gather all these people against my target. When I'm done with my target, then I will have this group of people to go to and they will support me, right? So, and it's really ridiculous when you think about what a narcissist's agenda is because when they discard you, they just don't want to discard you. They want to, in lots of cases, annihilate you. You know, they want to destroy your business. They want to turn your kids against you. They aren't happy until your neighbors are talking about you. They aren't happy until they embarrass you on social media. They aren't happy until you lose your job. They aren't happy until you're groveling. They aren't happy. They aren't happy unless you are absolutely sick to your stomach, struggling to get another job, anxious, you know, on medication, unable to think straight, unable to date, unable to move forward. You know, chaos in your life makes them feel emotionally regulated. And so, disconnecting you and isolating you from your friends and from your family is all part of their agenda to remain dominant and in control over you, but not just over you, but over the people that you love the most. So a narcissist, when they, when they start to discard you, it's almost like, well, if they can't have you and you can't be happy with them, 
then no one can have you and you can't have anyone, right? So if they don't want you, well, no one else should want you. And if you don't want them, you're not allowed to want anyone else. And if you're not happy with them, then you're just not allowed to be happy, right? Because how dare you be happy in spite of them? If you're happy in spite of them, then the narcissist has to consider like, you know, well, how is she happy without me? If she was the problem, then she should still be unhappy, right? And so a narcissist will struggle. A narcissist needs to see and believe that their target is the dysfunctional one. You'll go into therapy with a narcissist because the narcissist wants the therapist to affirm what they believe about you. And it's not uncommon for someone with high narcissistic traits to enter into therapy with the intention of turning the therapist against the target. And if the therapist is not really careful, the, nar the, ther the narcissist can sway in some situations the therapist. If the think about a codependent, a highly codependent person going into therapy, Thinking about, think about the anxiety, maybe even the anger, the frustration, the bewilderment, the disillusionment, the inability to think straight, right? Because they're in survival mode. And the narcissist who is not in survival mode comes, walks into a therapy session pretty calm. Look at my wife or look at my husband. Look at the mess that they're in. Look at the way they're reactive, right? Well, the target's in survival mode, which is a reactive mode. And the narcissist, as long as they're able to maintain control over their target, will appear pretty emotionally regulated. I've gone through this myself. Going into therapy, like feeling like my knees are scraping against the floor, completely spent thinking I'm losing my mind, trying to explain myself to a therapist, you know, and feeling really, really raw and vulnerable and wanting to get to the bottom of our stuff. And dealing with someone who was as cool as a cucumber going, look at her, she's a mess, right? Well, I was a mess because of what I was dealing with. I was a mess because you were passive aggressive or you were stonewalling me because you were one way in front of my family and another way behind closed doors and that's maddening. And I'm calling it out and you're telling me that I'm crazy, that I have no right to feel the way I feel. And when I come to you and I want to talk to you about what's really going on between the two of us, you treat me with indifference. You huff, you puff, you turn your head, and I can feel the disdain or the aggravation you feel for me wanting to connect with you and wanting to resolve this issue. When you're dealing with a narcissist, you have to understand it's a one-up game, right? A narcissist has to stay ahead of you. And that's why a narcissist will need to turn people against you. They need to turn people against you so that in all situations, you're at a dinner party, the narcissist has already spent time away from you, talking to your friends about you, setting the stage, telling, telling your friends that there's something up with you, that you're not sleeping or that you are starving yourself or they make up stories right? To make them look good, make them look like the hero or the heroine and in the story, and you are the defective one. So the setting, the setting the stage, oh, my poor wife, oh, my poor husband, right? And so in this situation, they're already setting the stage that they are the victim of you, right? So now when you're out and about, you don't know that the narcissist has gone out and spoken to your mother and your sister and your brother and your father and your coworkers, your best friend, right? You don't know why. In my situation, one day my mom called me, God rest her soul, and she said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, fine, why? And she never told me why. And it was like a year later that she said, oh, that was the day so-and-so called me and told me that you said you were going to hurt yourself. And I was like, ma, not for nothing, like when you called me and you said, are you okay? Why didn't you tell me that? Because we could have cleared this up then. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is. But when a narcissist is creating a flying monkey out of your family, it is so difficult. And if you are someone like me who spent your life trying to look like everything was perfect because you were taught that, God forbid you complained, you know, you were conditioned to think that if you complain, you're a drama queen, or in my situation, after two years, I went home and I said, Mom, I think I made a mistake after I got married. She said, go home. You made your bed, go lie in it. I got zero support. She didn't even ask me why I felt the way I felt, right? 
And so this idea of constantly being shut down, like your feelings do not matter. And when you are taught from the outside that your feelings do not matter, you don't know how to process your feelings. You go, you go and you deny them, you suppress them, and you do your best to pretend that you really don't feel the way you feel, but you do. There's this ocean of emotion within you and you pretending that you're not angry just makes things worse. You get more depressed, you get more anxious, you become more reactive. My base emotional set point was one of pure, absolute frustration, and my body was revolting. My poor body was revolting. I felt so stuck. I was doing everything wrong. I was suppressing what I felt. I was denying what I felt. I wasn't paying attention to what I felt. I was looking outside of me, trying to be perfect, trying to pretend I didn't feel this way, seeking my mother's validation, trying to be good enough, trying to be quiet enough, trying to tone myself down, trying to take care of people in my ex-husband's family, trying to anticipate his needs, trying to run a business with him, trying not to act like I needed anything. And all it did was destroy me. And I realized that I was invalidating myself. And I had no idea that behind the veil, he was talking to the neighbors about me. He was talking to my family about me. He was talking to his family about me. He was talking to our customers about me. I had no clue. And there I was shutting my mouth, trying so hard not to be a difficult person. I was so afraid of being seen as difficult because I had been programmed to become afraid of being viewed as difficult. So I didn't even realize that from childhood, I was brainwashed to fear opening my mouth because I had been conditioned, Pavlovian conditioning. I had been conditioned to fear someone saying, wow, you know what? You're a little difficult, aren't you? I heard it my whole life. You know, my father and I, God rest his soul, he recently just passed away as well. But my father let me know in many different ways that I was difficult. And anyone that challenged my father on any level was seen as difficult. And my sister, in my opinion, learned to be agreeable with him because she didn't want to lose his validation. I was lucky compared to her because very early on, I ended up breaking away from the family. And when, he actually, when they actually moved out of state, I was able to recognize that this was my need. I needed to start focusing on myself, which is the time in my life where I finished writing The Road Back to Me. And I decided that I need to get a divorce. Like this is going to be the most difficult thing in the world for me to do, but I'm going for it. I'm absolutely going to get a divorce and take care of myself. When you're involved with a narcissist, they must triangulate you. They must try to turn people against you. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with a narcissist, they don't want to leave any stone unturned. So if you're part of a Facebook community, if you're part of a church community, if you're part of a business, then behind your back, little by little, the narcissist is going to try to create flying monkeys. They will distort the truth to make it fit their narrative, right? If you were in a relationship with the narcissist, most of the times it started off while you were on a pedestal. So they idealized you. And in the idealizing of you, they felt good about themselves. But the minute, because again, because they can't see people as good and bad and understand that everybody has good and everybody has bad, and they can't see it within themselves. They see themselves as perfect and, and they see themselves as the perfect victim. So in other words, they're the perfect victim and you're going to take care of them and you're going to validate them. You're going to praise them. You're going to hold their hand. You're going to feel sorry for them. You're going to make sure you're going to idealize them. You're going to take care of every single one of their needs. You're going to anticipate their needs. And the moment you say something or the moment you do something that triggers them, you're out, you're done and you will pay for all of the unresolved stuff that's within them and they will not understand what they're doing. They will absolutely believe it's all your fault because they posture themselves as a victim. And so they will turn people against you to perpetuate that narrative, to protect their false image, to protect this idea that they're a victim and you victimize them. 
nothing comes into their head about this idea okay. that, that has them recognizing that they're being vindictive or they're hurting you or they're twisting the story. It won't enter their minds. And that's why it's better off to just shutty shutty when it comes to a narcissist. You're wasting your breath. You're talking about someone who has a false self, who has a cognitive bias against who you are. They have a personal narrative. They're the victim and you victimize them. They don't understand that they are wounded within themselves because people who are integrated don't react this way. People who don't have these, these severe traumas from the past are not, going to, not, are not going to lay them at your feet and persecute you and want to bring you down. There are people who are wounded and they're trying to work on their wounds and they recognize that the people in their experience did not wound them, these new people. They recognize that, wow, this is coming from either my marriage or my childhood or both. And I'm not going to react to people, strangers and whatever the case may be because of these wounds. I'm going to work on these wounds. I'm not going to blame my children because of these wounds. I'm not going to persecute my children because of these wounds. I'm really going to work on myself so that I don't project this onto other people and reinforce this trauma, you know, into the future with my children. I'm really going to work on my stuff. But when you're dealing with a narcissist, that's not the case. A narcissist gets triggered. They feel this pain. You're standing right next to them. So it's your fault and you will suffer the consequences. And so the need to pull people into this drama has to do with them needing to protect, perpetuate this idea that they're a victim. And they also need to stay in control and dominance over all of their relationships. They need to stay in control over what you see in them. They need to stay in control over your emotions. They need to dominate you. Right? So in the relationship, they will dominate you. And outside of the relationship, they dominate you by pulling people into or triangulating other people against you. So that when they're out and about, you bring them to the office, an office Christmas party. They're feeling pretty in control because they're, you know, they're sipping on their martini and they know that Mary thinks you're out of your mind. And they look over at Harry and they know that Harry thinks, well, poor Josh hanging out with Susie Q. Like, wow. How you doing, Josh? Josh, what a hero. I heard Susie Q's got all these emotional problems and look at Josh supporting his woman, right? This is what they do. So they're in control. They go to the bank and they, they've already manipulated what the bank person thinks about you, right? I mean, it just goes on forever. And when you end up getting kicked out of this narcissistic relationship and you go to your friends and you go to your family for, for support, you're often completely blindsided by this idea that they're defending the narcissist, which is just so cruel. But again, when we're understanding that this is a game of dominance, this is a game of power, and this is a game of control. It's very difficult in the moment to wrap your mind around this idea that the people that should have loved you, your family, your friends, your coworkers, people that you've known for a long time, it's really hard in the moment to recognize that they've been manipulated too. If you find yourself in this situation, try to do everything that you can to take care of yourself. Find a therapist, find a support group, find someone that believes in you, find someone that can validate your experiences. I find it very, very helpful to, to write a timeline of events so that th this can help you feel like solid, like you get a timeline of events so that you know that these things actually did happen. Because when you're dealing with someone who has high narcissistic traits, they tell you that didn't happen. I don't know where you get that from. I don't know why you're telling that story. I don't know why you tell yourself that. I don't know why you believe that that's not the way it happened. And you can really, really begin to doubt yourself. So never go to someone who has already minimized you looking for validation of their abuse because it doesn't happen. They are the victim. So when you go to them and say, don't you know how cruel that was? They're not going to validate you and that's going to invalidate you even further. So try to get in the habit of acknowledging how you feel, staying in your body, right? Grounding yourself to time and space. Try to pick up meditation. Meditation is a great way to slow down the mental field. Do what you can to let, maybe even pull yourself away from flying monkeys, right? Don't pick up from the, don't pick up the phone 
when it's people on the other end that are you think are seeking information for the narcissist if you have to shut down your facebook account and shut down your instagram account for a while so that you could cocoon yourself from this type of abuse then do it but remember that you're going to need support and you're going to need knowledge you're going to need to figure out what happened to you so you can make sense of how you feel all of the confusion and all of the bewilderment is normal considering what you went through. Narcissists are tremendous liars. They're tremendous at distorting the truth and they're tremendous at coming off like the victim. You could give the narcissist your heart, your soul, your life. It still won't be enough. They'll still feel like you victimized them. And if you're not careful, you can fall for this. If you're not careful, you'll end up feeling bad because you weren't able to make the narcissist feel better, look better, and be better. Be very, very careful when you figure out that the narcissist has begun to turn people against you. Hey, if you love this content, don't forget to check out the next video. And you can go to my website and take the codependency quiz.